All right. Well, let's pray and we'll get started with our Bible study for tonight. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is sufficient. And though coronavirus is not found in its pages, we know that your wisdom is found throughout. I pray that you would, God, I pray that you would speak through me, that you would speak through your word, and that we would see clearly what we are called to do as your followers. We would respond in joy. We would respond in faith. And we would respond in obedience. God, we thank you for your son, whose resurrection we celebrated yesterday. We pray that we would live in light of that life, a life that is more abundant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, let's see. Melissa joined. She just walked right in during the prayer, but that's okay. We're glad you're here. Um, see, Tress isn't here. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. If you guys, like I said, we'll start in Romans 13. And our goal tonight is... Uh, is to look at what the scriptures teach us about how to respond to our government, uh, especially when we may not agree with everything our government is saying and doing. Uh, this was really put on my heart, and I started writing this probably five times, um, started thinking through this five or six times, and just I was struggling because in my own heart, in my own soul, I am often tempted to fail in all these ways. And I was tempted with frustration. I was tempted with annoyance. I was tempted in a lot of ways. And and uh, I shared that with a friend. And my friend said, well, it sounds like you need to keep writing it then. And that was true. I mean, this is not something I'm writing about because I find submitting to our government easy. This is something that I wanted to talk about and study with you because I find it difficult. And, and because I think a lot of us are finding it difficult. As I've read social media, as I've looked even on um, posts, I had a friend send me one of those discernment websites where they were making outlandish and foolish claims about what the Bible says and does not say, um, calling people ignorant if they don't agree. I mean, that's not what Christians are called to do. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to be gracious people. So we are going to dive into this passage, and we're going to see what God's Word has to say for us. I'm going to read Romans 13, 1 through 7. We'll get a little further into the context, but it's important to remember the larger context of Romans. So Paul has told us what salvation is in Romans 1 through 12, or 1 through 11. And in chapter 12 onward, he tells us how that applies. And in this section, he's telling us how our salvation applies to our view of our government and how we respond. So let's read our text. I'm reading from the ESV here on the screen it says let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except god and those that exist have been instituted by god therefore whoever resists the authorities resists what god has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment for rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad would you have no fear of the one who is in authority then do what is good and you will receive his approval for he is god's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Now, again, normally when uh, when I do one of these online, I like to try and walk through the passage with you and, and do all the active dividing together. But again, for this one, I think the key to understand this passage is following Paul's logical argument. And I've seen many people try and get around this passage and what the clear teaching of the word says and they do that by ignoring the logical flow. So I'm going to show you, um, this is still the, the ESV. Now, all the words in black are words of Scripture. Everything else is little things I've added. So here is our first section here, which it looks like I've made a little bit too big. I need to shrink my video of myself. There we go. Um, but here's here's what it says. Here's our main point. Main point number one. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Now, how do we know that's the main point? Well, that is simple. Let me get this. Where'd it go? There we go. Um, 
this word here, be subject, is a command. So I'm going to put it in purple text. That'd be hard to read. I'll highlight it purple. In my mind, purple like a king. So it's a command. Be subject. This is our key section here. Be subject to the governing authorities. And then we get some reasons and some results. Why should we be subject to governing authorities? Paul could have just told us to. Right? He's the Apostle Paul. He speaks with the authority of God. He could have just said, do it. But instead, he tells us why. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For, and then here in blue, light blue, I've got, what's he explaining? Why be subject? Why should we do this? For these two reasons. Reason number one. There is no authority except from God. Now, what does that mean? There is no authority except from God? Well, it's pretty clear. If someone has authority, where'd they get it from? They got it from God. That's really the only possible answer here. It's the only way to take what is being said. And then he says the opposite. And those that exist have been instituted by God. I love how clear Paul is, is making this because he knows how often we try and wiggle out of things. He says there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So how many authorities are from God? Every single one of them. There is no excuse. You can't say, yeah, well, my boss is horrible. Well, he is an authority because of God. He's been instituted by God. Not only did God allow it to happen, God specifically put him in place. He is sovereign over who is sovereign in this life. Psalms tell us that the heart of the king flows like a river through the hand of God. He turns it where it will go. That's the Andrew version. I misquoted a little bit, but that's the point is God controls even the heart of the king. He is sovereign over all things. And so we must be subject to governing authorities for why? Why should we do it? Because all authority comes from God and the authorities that exist were instituted by God. Therefore, right? So when he says, therefore, we say, what's the therefore? Therefore, what's his point? Because God instituted our authorities. What does that result in? Number one, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed. And number two, those who resist will incur judgment. Well, why will they incur judgment? For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Now, I think this is a powerful passage. We must be subject to our governing authorities. That is a command of scripture. And I've heard some people try and get out of this because they say, well, the word authorities here, um, that's only X, Y, Z. I read a specific article um, or a, I heard about an article. I didn't read the whole thing uh, today that said, well, this word authorities in the, in the Greek, it just means the foundation of authority. And so they took the example of in the United States, the foundation of the government's authority is the Constitution. Therefore, if the government says something against the Constitution, then we can ignore what the government says and do what we want. However, this word authorities is not really used that way. It's used all throughout the scriptures for a bunch of different kinds of authorities. And Paul's pretty clear. He doesn't just say authorities. He says governing authorities, whoever is in charge. The Constitution hopefully governs our land, but functionally, the Constitution is not in the Oval Office. It's not in the Senate chamber. We are governed by the authorities. We're governed by those who are authoritative over us, whoever those governing authorities are. And we could say, even if we're trying to get around that, and this is what bothers me so much, if we look at these reasons, why should we be subject to the governing authorities, including our current government, our local, state, federal, why should we be subject to them? Because there is no authority except from God and those that exist to be instituted by God. That includes our current president. That includes our current Senate and House. That includes all of our local leaders. And no matter what happens in November, that includes who wins those elections as well. It's not just we must be subject to the documents of the past. We are subject to the ones who are governing currently. This is a present verb or a present word. It's, it's describing what's happening right now. We are subject to who is governing right now. And what is the result of that? It, it's ultimately, and I tried to show this in the way I've organized this, but the results stem from, they stem from the reasons. Because God instituted our authorities, because that is the truth, it is therefore true that whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. That should make logical sense to us. If uh, 
uh, I mean, many of you grew up with siblings. If your mother sent your older sibling to tell you to do something and you told that older sibling no, you're not ultimately defying that older sibling. You're defying your parent. The one who puts authority in someone is the ultimate authority. So when we resist the authorities God has put over us, well, we're resisting God himself, and those who resist will incur judgment. And it's interesting, he doesn't use the word rebel. He doesn't use the word um, fight back. He says resist. It's, it's a word that means oppose or resist. It comes from the Greek word estame. If you're interested, it, it means to stand, to take a stand. How many of us have heard people talking about that we need to stand up for our rights? That as Christians, we need to stand up for our rights. Friends, Paul specifically says those who resist, those who stand up for their rights against their government, are standing up against God, and they will incur judgment. Why? Because rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Now, we know that phrase is generally true, not always true. Often governments reward those who are wicked and punish those who are righteous. We know that's true. And we might say, well, if that's generally true, then this must be generally true. We should only sometimes obey our government. And I know that's a real temptation, but let's think about that very, very carefully. Uh, and if you have your Bibles, you can go to Acts chapter 5 for a good example of this. Acts chapter 5. Uh, and if you're following... Please share this video, invite your friends to watch with you. But in Acts chapter 5, we have this famous example where the Jewish leaders command the apostles not to speak in the name of Christ anymore. And what do they say? They say, we, uh, the Pharisees say, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. I've heard this verse quoted a lot over the last couple weeks in videos where pastors are yelling at the police in all kinds of social media posts. But here's the thing. Look, to, look specifically at what Peter says. We must obey God rather than men. The word rather there implies a contrast, a specific contrast. Therefore, if we're going to obey God rather than men, God and men must be telling us to do opposite things, contradictory things. So it is not wrong to resist government when government tells us to violate scripture. The apostles are an example of this. We also have the midwives in Egypt. Pharaoh said, kill the baby boys. They did not, and they were blessed. The Hebrew boys in Babylon, who did not bow down to the golden statue, they were blessed. The apostles in Jerusalem, another example. Daniel was told not to pray, and he prayed. Throughout scripture, we see civil disobedience. It is respectful. It is kind. It is never rude. It is never for their own publicity. And it is only in situations where a direct contradiction exists. Only in those situations. So when it comes to questions about submitting to governments, we must ask, does, the, does this order, does this law, does this mandate, does it require us to violate the scriptures? And obviously, my mind is filled with the examples of what we're going through right now with the coronavirus and the stay-at-home mandates and everything else. And ultimately, we must answer no. This is not a violation of the scriptures. Why do I say that? Well, if we look to the scriptures, um, and before we go there, I've seen this on a lot of church signs, and they're right. The buildings are empty, but the church is not, because the church is not a building. The church is the gathered assembly. The church is the gathered assembly. It is the people. So I, I want to go to Hebrews 10 because this is another passage that is often used. The author of Hebrews says, Let us hold fast to uh, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to be clear. Christians should want to be in church. Christ died for the church. If right now you are not missing being together with your church, I would caution you to question your salvation. 
Jesus loves the church. The expectation, the assumption throughout the New Testament is that Christians will meet together on the Lord's Day. So I'm not at all, I mean, I'm trying to plant a church. Obviously, I, I think we should be in church. But there's nothing in Scripture that commands us. We must be in church every Sunday, even every week. There's nothing in Scripture that commands us. The closest is this passage, but notice the command is consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. What is one way we can do that? Because this is a participle. It's not the verb. It's not the imperative. It's not the command. This is just one way we can do that. We can choose not to neglect to meet together. That is one way we can consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So if you've felt in your heart a question or a comment of, well, is it wrong for my church to not meet? Is it wrong for these churches to not meet? Let me ask you. The most important thing is that we're holding fast to our own confession. We're believing that God is faithful and that we are considering how to stir one another up to love and good works. You can do that at home. If you're upset about churches being closed, but you haven't been texting people and praying for people and loving people and encouraging them and stirring them up to love and good works, you've missed the point of the passage. So here's why I say this. And, and I, again, we take authority and truth from Scripture, not from logic. But there are some logical issues that I really, really have. Because there's no uh, passage in Scripture that requires Christians to meet every Sunday, then we cannot say it is a sin to not meet on Sunday. And I don't think we have a biblical justification for resisting, for standing up to our government. Because if we say it is wrong to not meet, if we say that this is the government violating Scripture, then we must also say that any church who has canceled their services because of snow or ice has sinned. We must say that any time that we ourselves have chosen not to go to church because we have been sick, we must say we've sinned. If you've ever been on vacation and not made it to church while you're out on vacation, you've sinned. Not to mention that we condemn saints all around the world who are unable to meet both now and in the past because of persecution. Are we willing to say that all of those situations are sin? I I'm not, because I don't think the scriptures do. And thus, when we come to this passage and we say, should I be subject to my government about this stay-at-home order? Should I be subject to my government about these quarantine rules? Should I do that? Well, the scriptures don't teach against it. And I would argue that to not submit to our government, to resist the authorities, we are resisting God. We are incurring judgment against ourselves. And this is a dangerous, dangerous, and difficult thing. I want to be clear because I, I know with this kind of thing, I can't see who's walking in and out at what I'm saying. So I hope I haven't offended anyone. And I hope that no one joins and just hears me say, the Bible doesn't say you have to go to church and then they leave. You know, that's not, that would make me sad. We should be in church. We should love church. Jesus died for the church. We should have that same love for the church. The New Testament is incredibly church centered around the church centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. The the church is important. Don't hear me say it's not. But what's more important is living righteously according to what the Word of God says. And the Word of God does not command us to meet every week, and thus to choose not to meet every week as we submit to our government is not sin, but I would say is righteous. Now, I want to be clear because Romans 14 talks about not judging, and I want to be careful that I'm not passing judgment on anyone else. I think every person, every pastor will stand before God in at the judgment one day, and will give an account for what his church did during this time. And I understand that. But I would argue if, if you know someone, or if you yourself have been someone focusing on resisting, standing up to the government for your rights, if you've been violating government orders without scriptural mandate, I would argue that you are living in sin. You are choosing to stand up for your rights rather than to submit to the government for the sake of the gospel. And, and I want to go to First Peter very quickly. I did not know these two verses were together. I've heard these verses all the time. Uh, verse 12, keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. You've heard that verse hundreds of times, but did you realize verse 13, the next one says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. 
You understand that that verse that we know so well, the very next verse says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So even if you don't like submitting to the government, uh, I know some people just like you have to pay your tax bill and it's just, oh, it grates your soul. Do it for the Lord's sake. Because you're ultimately, as Romans 13 tells us, we're submitting to God when we submit to our government. I'm going to go into this next section here, but if you have any questions, be sure to post them in the chat. I'm trying to follow along here as I go. Remember, there's that 40-second delay, so if I don't answer you right away, I'm not trying to be rude. Just don't see it. So in summary, his main point is let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Because God instituted it. Therefore, when we resist, when we stand up for our rights, well, then we are standing up against God. And that whole idea of standing up for our rights, I was talking with a friend of mine who's a missionary in Europe, and he was talking about how the world is watching how Americans are responding, especially American Christians. And as they watch, especially think about the people in Italy, as they watch thousands in Spain, tens of thousands of people die from this virus, and they look to America and they see Christians yelling about their right to do what they want. What does that say about the gospel? What does that say about the gospel? It's a challenge, I think, that we need to be mindful of. Um, the clear, constant testimony of Scripture, when it talks about our rights and our freedoms, is that it gives us opportunity to lay them down for the sake of the gospel. It never tells us to stand up for them. Now let's go into this next section, um, because we want to see main point number two. Main point number two is that we should do good that we don't have to fear the government. What is his point here? Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then, option one, he gives us two options. We can do what is good, and you will receive his approval, the authority's approval. Four, why will you receive the authority's approval? Because he is God's servant for your good. Now again, this is generally true. Not all the time, uh, does the government reward righteousness and punish evil? That's its goal. That's its job. That's what it's called to do. But generally, if we do what is good, we will receive approval. And I think we've seen that in the world. We've seen churches that are refusing to obey government, and they are being thought of as evildoers. We go back to this passage. Um, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. There are many places where they are not responding honorably, and it's obvious. The government is sanctioning them and punishing them. So we do what is good, and we will receive his approval. Option number two, but if we do wrong, and it's interesting, this, um, this is another imperative. Be afraid. Do what is good is an imperative. It's a command. It tells us to do, to obey, but so is this. If you do wrong, Paul commands us to be afraid. He commands us to be afraid of our government if we violate what it says. Why should we be afraid? For he does not bear the sword in vain. Uh, back in Genesis, God established that if life is taken, life for life. Moses established tooth for tooth. Now, Jesus gives us some grace there, but legally that, that system of judgment and justice is to be handled by the government. And they bear the sword, not in vain, but for God. Because why? Why does he bear the sword? He's the servant of God. That's pointing us back to point number one above. And number two, he's an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Not like the movies. Um, I, I remember a lot of shirts like, God is my avenger. And I'm like, well, that's not great because God avenges when he takes wrath out on a wrongdoer. So that's not really a great shirt slogan. Uh, I hope I didn't offend anybody. But listen, God he pours out his wrath on wrongdoing. And it's this wrongdoing here, in context, what is he defining? He's not talking about sin in, in the moral sense against God's law. He's not talking about gossip or um, things that are immoral but not illegal. In context, this wrongdoer here, it has to be violating what this, the government says. It says that God is an avenger, or he uses the government as an avenger to carry out God's wrath on those who violate the government, who violate the government's orders. Therefore, because God's wrath is on the wrongdoer, one must be in subjection. That's the result. Why? 
not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. God's, <laughs> listen, God is telling us that if we want to not only avoid God's wrath, but we want to have a clear conscience before God and man, well, to do that, we're going to have to obey. We're going to have to obey the scriptures. We're going to have to obey our government in context. That's his point. For the sake of our conscience, our conscience should be pricked when we violate the scriptures. Um, some people take this so far as to say that speeding is an example where we violated the, the authority of our government. I personally feel that way. I don't speed for that reason because I feel like I am violating this passage, but I know others don't necessarily agree. And I wouldn't, I'm not going to fight that fight because some people make the argument, well, the government doesn't really expect you to. And I get it. I don't agree. But, but here's the thing that doesn't apply to these coronavirus quarantines. It's, it's, it's not like the government's like, nah, do what you want. We'll let you go 5, 10 over. We'll let you do 500. Oh, it, that's not how it works. It's not a similar situation. Paul's point is clear. Do you want to have no fear of our authorities, of our government? Then do what's good. And how does he define good? Obey the government. But if you do wrong, if you don't obey the government, you should be afraid because you will not have a clear conscience before God and you will not avoid God's wrath. That's a powerful statement. This is not a minor thing. I heard um, one of the problems that our government is having right now is that because the, uh, the IRS is sending out those checks to people, a bunch of people are filing taxes for the first time. And I'm like, you should be paying taxes. We should be Submitting to our government, we should be doing it. And Paul talks about taxes specifically in just a moment. But listen, friends, we must do what is good, not just for our own sake, but again, being gospel-centered on mindset, Peter is very clear about this. For the Lord's sake, be subject to every human institution. I love this. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. How many people do we know that are walking around begging to learn what is the will of God for my life. Well, I can't tell you who should marry, what job you should take, but I can tell you that the will of God is that you would obey your government and your bosses and whatever else is, is going on in your life. I see there's a question in our chat. I'm going to look at that real quick. Uh, let's see. Sarah said, isn't it true that the original authors of these passages would have written this in the time of the Roman emperors and some of them were hunting down and killing Christians? Yes. How much more or how much more easily can we submit to our democratic leaders? I think that's a great point. Um, I've heard people talk about how the church is being persecuted right now in America. But I don't I mean, I wouldn't say they're persecuting the NBA or any other large gatherings. I don't think we're being persecuted. But I think when Paul wrote this to the Romans, the Christians living in Rome, who were blamed for a fire and were thrown to wild animals. My wife and I, when we were on vacation last year, we got to go to the Colosseum, and I stood in the midst of that place where hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe more uh, Christians, our faithful ancestors, were torn apart by hungry, starving wild animals. That's persecution. And you know what? They still honored the emperor. They still spoke with grace. They still were loving. They still obeyed in every way that they could, but they would not violate scripture. So if tomorrow the CDC says in order to, uh, in order to be in, uh, I forgot a word. It starts with C. In order to obey our mandates, you must worship the leader of the CDC. You must worship President Trump. Well, yeah, don't do that. Because that violates scripture, but that's not what Paul is talking about. That's not what's being asked of us now. He says, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good. You will receive his approval. So we've seen main point number one. Main point number one, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? They've been instituted by God and they are a terror to bad conduct, not good. And if we resist the authorities, if we stand up, that's what that word means. If we stand up to our authorities, we are standing up to God. 
Main point number two, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, you will receive his reward. But if you do wrong, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. He is an avenger. Therefore, because God's wrath is on the wrongdoer, be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And then we get to um, <clears throat> this next section. It's not so much a third point as it is an application of the first two. And Paul summarizes it just to make sure that we've got this. For because of this, because of reason one and two that he stated that he'll summarize again below, you also pay taxes. This is a another imperative. Pay taxes. Here's another one. Pay to all that is owed them. Pay taxes. Why? For, why should we pay taxes? For the authorities are ministers of God. That's summary of point number, this should say point number one. I'm going to edit that because it's going to confuse me later if I don't. And they are attending to this very thing. I think the very thing is a summary of point number two, that they are avenging. They are bearing the sword. They are punishing evil and promoting righteousness. Because of these things, because of the summary of points one and two above, pay to all what is owed to them. Pay to all what is owed to them. He gives us four examples. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. That'd be income tax, that'd be uh, population tax, like a, like a civil tax. Revenue, to whom revenue is owed, that would be like a poll tax or a toll tax. Anything that impedes your business. Respect, to whom respect is owed. And listen, I know a lot of Christians. Um, I know a lot of Christians who are not meeting together. They're submitting to the government's orders, but they are not giving any respect or honor. And I've heard the argument, it's not owed to them because they X, Y, Z. But here's the thing. If anyone had a right to complain about their government, it was Paul in this moment. His emperor at this time was Nero, who um, put his horse in the Senate. He made him a senator. He lit a fire in Rome so he could build a bigger palace. He was generally a crazy human being. Um. I don't know if that's very honorable. I guess maybe I shouldn't say it that way. He's not my governor. He's not my emperor. But um, historically, we understand there was something very wrong with this man, that he was power hungry to the nth degree. And yet he says, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Back in First Peter, another just a parallel passage. He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. You know who put Peter to death? Probably the emperor, probably Nero, probably the man he's telling us to honor. If we fear God, we will honor the emperor. So revenue to whom revenue, respect to whom respect, and honor to whom honor is owed. We don't get to decide to whom honor is owed. Why? Back up here. The authorities are ministers of God. And attending, they are attending this very thing. They are doing God's will in your life. Whether you like it or not, whether you approve of their job or not, whether the approval rating of our government is low or high, they are ministers of God. Does that mean God approves of everything they do and that God supports one party over there? Of course not. But it does mean, it does mean that God is sovereign over it. He put them in place and we are called to submit to them. So we pay them. That's our application for tonight. That's the big point that Paul wants us to drive home and understand. Because, point number one, we must be subject to governing authorities because God has put them there. We must do what is good because they will carry out wrath on us. We will be judged both by God and by our government. We will face God's wrath. We will have a broken conscience if we do not obey our authorities. Because of these things, let us pay to all what is owed to them. So, certainly, pay your taxes. I know tax day is coming up. Pay your taxes. I mean, that's a clear very basic application, but it's not the only application. The CDC is telling us what to do. The White House, our local governments are commanding us. I saw someone recently, they um, got takeout from a restaurant, set up a tent in the parking lot and gathered like 50 people together and ate because they were standing up for their rights. Listen, that's not, that's not what's owed. That is not what is owed. And if we look at the next couple verses here, I really think it drives the point home. He says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. Not just the law of God, but the law of our government. Love one another. If, listen, 
he's summarizing the law of God. And he goes on to do that in these next couple of verses. He says the law of God, whoever loves has fulfilled the law. The law. I, I don't think there's any argument that can be made that says meeting together with the possibility of infecting people and killing people and making people sick is the loving thing to do. It's not an argument that can be made. I think rather an argument can be made that a loving thing to do would be to be cautious, to be obedient, to out of, for the sake of the Lord, as First Peter would say, and out of love for one another, we choose not to meet together right now. Out of obedience, both to God and to his authorities that he's put in place. Um, I'm not trying to overstep. I'm not trying to be judgmental. My heart is broken for these churches. I mean, I, I am also a pastor. I understand how difficult it is to not meet with my people. I am. Um, I'm really struggling with it. Honestly, y'all could pray for me. I'm really struggling. This is not, it's not like I'm like, oh man, I got a couple weeks off. What a great vacation. I'm so glad the church is shut down. I hate it. I hate it. But because I love the people around me and I desire to flatten the curve, I desire to love people, I desire to help our healthcare systems. You know, one of my friends is a, is a nurse in our local hospital. I don't want him to be overwhelmed because I decided to have church and infect a bunch of people. So out of love for one another, out of a desire for a clear conscience, out of a desire to avoid God's wrath, out of a desire to be obedient to God himself, our church is not meeting. And, and I would encourage and challenge that that must be the decision of every other church. Now, if at some point, right, after a couple, if it's been years or something, right, at some point, if the government just says you can never meet again, that's, that's an issue. But that's not the case. And this is one of those classic things where people say, well, what if this crazy thing happens? Okay, well, when that crazy thing happens, we'll talk about it. But that's not what's happening now. What's happening now is a temporary waiting period. Let us rejoice in that waiting period. I see a comment over here. I'm going to look at this real quick. It says, your explanation of Hebrews 10 and the participle of not failing to meeting uh, together is very helpful. It's for a pastor who is accusing believers of forsaking the assembling of ourselves and using that verse to say we must resist the government. Right. So here's the other thing about that. And I'm, uh, I got to look up this passage real quick. I've got my Bible app here. Um, that word forsaking, I'll try and show this. I don't know if y'all are interested in this, but that word forsaking, look at the way it's translated. It's translated forsake, abandoned, deserted, left, neglecting. If I'm sick and I choose not to go to church out of love for people, that's not abandoning them. That's not forsaking them. That's not deserting them. Um, like in this, uh, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says, never leave or forsake, not neglecting. So there's, there's that passage. The Lord of hosts has not left us offspring. These are not where it's just like, it's not convenient for me to go to church or I'm taking the easy way out. That's not the case. The passage is clearly talking about those who just out of lack of love, choose not to go to church. This is the opposite. Out of love, we're choosing not to gather together at this point. Another question. I'm going to answer this one. It says, the question I have is when would it be appropriate to resist the government when they make a law that says we cannot have regular meetings? I agree the regular meeting is not a doctrine in Scripture. It's more of an assumed thing because we are brothers and sisters in Christ that want to be together to worship and be encouraged. So how do we figure this out? I find this to be a tough question for myself to answer. Absolutely. It's a tough question. Um, but let me make a an auxiliary point, and I'll bring it back. Many people, when talking about abortion and laws about abortion, will say, well, what about the underprivileged woman who's been raped by her relative? And they just make the worst possible situation, and they say, well, should abortion be allowed then? But here's the thing. That's less than half of 1% of all abortions are situations like that. And here's, I'm not saying you're doing this, to be clear. I'm not condemning the person who asked this question. But when we say, what about this extreme thing that could happen? How do we respond right now? Those are two very different situations. We can't deal with the extreme to answer the regular. Now, specifically to the question we have to think about, at what point should we resist the government? I think that's a fair question. And... Ultimately, I don't have an answer. So, for instance, if there was a church who 
right now it's April 13th. If the government were to say we're extending the quarantine for another three months and they said, well, we're, we're only going to wait another month and then we're going to start meeting. At some point they have obeyed the government and they are choosing not so much to resist, but to, um, to resist at some point they have chosen to obey. And then, I mean, that's very different than just absolutely refusing to submit the entire time. And, and that's really, I think the issue here in mind, um, when to resist is when they get to a point where it is not an issue of where, where it's an issue of violation of scripture. So if we get to a point where the infection rate is zero and there's no new cases, and the government still won't let us meet. Well, we're not motivated by love to not meet anymore. That's not an issue. The government may just be overstepping at that point. And I could see us choosing to meet at that point, but only not out of, resistance to the government. And I really think a big part of this is an attitude. If I were ever to make the decision to have church when the government told me not to, my heart would be broken over that, not joyfully defiant. We should not rejoice in breaking the law. Now, I know that doesn't specifically answer your question, Joe. Um, and ultimately, I, I don't know that there is a specific answer to your question. I think that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that's going to be based on how things respond. One of the things we know is that things are going to look different. Like a, a lot of our quarantines end at the end of this month, and it, everything's not going to go back to normal right away. I know some churches that are planning on having church outside, everyone six, six feet apart, like Sermon on the Mount style. And, and that way we're still avoiding infection, but we're able to gather. I don't know what that's going to look like. But I do know that God's word is sufficient. And as much as I would love to dive into examples like, well, is it sin if we have church in May, but not sin if we have church in June? I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. But I do know that today has enough trouble for itself. So I'm going to worry about today <laughs> because I'm going to let God have control tomorrow. Some other questions I thought of that might be running through your minds. Uh, but isn't the government restricting our religious freedom? No. They're restricting everyone's freedoms. And every, the, the NBA is restricted, right? So we're being asked for a time to avoid large gatherings. We can obey in clear conscience, and we must obey to have a clear conscience. What about my rights? Again, the Bible is consistent that the goal of a Christian in their rights is to lay them down for the sake of others. Questions like, but what will happen if we don't uh, get to start meeting next month? Let's let God worry about that. As much as you and I miss church, as much as I miss my church, gathered my church, um, as much as my church misses gathering together, our Savior misses our gathered church more than we do. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Neither will coronavirus, neither will quarantine. So let's let God deal with the future. Let's worry about today. Uh, another question. Well, can I at least complain about it? No. Um, that would not be giving honor to whom honor is due. That would not be giving respect to whom respect is due. And another question, how does this impact the witness of my lo local church? Like we said, First Peter 2. Um, <clears throat> there's something I, I want to point out in this passage as well. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. If we choose to meet right now and ignore the government, well, then we're going to look like evildoers and they're not going to see good deeds. They're going to see evil deeds. They're not going to glorify God. They're going to condemn us. And I hear a lot of people talking about we need to stand up for our religious rights. But look, if we stand up now when we don't really have a leg to stand on, we won't be able to later. So let us keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable. And I think this passage can help us interpret Romans 13. So, Joe, to your question about when should we start meeting, well, let's say it's it's been a month and a half further, and no one in our society thinks it would be wrong to gather, but for some reason the government is still forbidding it. That's going to be a different situation than right now, where if a church gathers, they are condemned on all sides. Again, we don't make decisions as a church based on what people will think of us. But there is some aspect where we need to be mindful of our corporate witness. Like I said, my missionary friend had told me that Christians are watching American Christians respond. 
And we want to make sure that, that both Christians and other places and Gentiles, unsafe people, that when they see our conduct, they say, that is honorable. And when they try and speak against us as evildoers in the future, when they do t try and take our religious liberty away, they'll see our good deeds and they'll glorify God rather than speaking against us as evildoers and having a bunch of things to point to. I think this is one way we can interpret Romans 13. And we always want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. And I think First Peter gives us um, not a clear-cut answer, but an answer. It points us to the answer. When should we be meeting? Well, certainly not when everyone around us says it would be evil to meet. I think that would be, if nothing else, we're not avoiding the appearance of evil at that point. I think we're falling into some sinful thought patterns and habits there. I'm going to take a second and get a drink because my throat is very dry. Um, and again, this delay is about 40 seconds. So I'm going to see if anybody has any questions, and then I will, uh, I will answer those questions as best I can. All right, I see there's a comment. And again, please ask any questions you have about this passage, about other passages, whatever questions you have, be sure to ask. Um, but I see Sarah has said, I think it's helpful to try and read Scripture as a Christian and not an American. If we think of ourselves as Christians first, it may be easier to, for us to hold fast to Scripture instead of holding fast to our rights, to remember original authors and the original recipients of the text. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great point. Not just because my wife said it, uh, though that does help, but I think she's absolutely right. Um, we are called to be Christians. We are citizens of heaven. We view this life as, we, we view this country. I'm not an American first. I'm a Christian first. I'm a citizen of heaven first. I am from a far off country. And I love being an American. I'm thankful for it. It is definitely the one I would pick. But um, I'm glad that I'm in heaven first. I'm glad that's my first citizenship. And I need to read the scriptures as a Christian and filter my American experience through that rather than filtering, filtering um, the scriptures through my context. Think about the way the Romans would have read this passage. Would they have been talking about standing up for their rights? Especially the Jewish people in Rome, the Christians in Rome who their religion was illegal. Would they have been thinking, "Oh, I need to stand up for my rights"? No, they they would have been, they would have been struggling, but they would have been struggling very differently than us. So try and read scriptures through a scriptural mindset. Absolutely. Uh, here's a question. Oh, from Sarah. What are some practical steps we can think through to have a heart posture of submission to our government? I know I struggle with this. Me too. So here's a great answer. Um, Bible tells us do all things without grumbling with thanksgiving. Um, so whenever I am counseling myself, when I'm counseling others and they're really struggling with their spouse or their kids or whatever the situation is, I encourage them to make a thank list and, and to keep it with them, either in a note on their phone or a, a physical notebook, if you like paper, and to write down every time you are tempted to be frustrated at your government, just choose, put that off, renew your mind and think that God has put them there. God has called me to, to do what is good. God has called me to give them what is owed. And then write down something that you're thankful for. Just spend as long as you have to until you think of something. So if the road outside your street is functional, even if it has potholes, um, I mean, be thankful for the fact that you can kind of drive on it, right? There's always something to be thankful for. It's easy to be sarcastic, but find something to be thankful for. So every time you're tempted, I think a thankfulness list would help. Another example or another practical thing is to meditate on how Jesus responded to our government. We always want to be gospel focused in our response. So as much as I'm trying to say, we must be subject, we must do what is good. Why are we able to do that? Because Jesus himself was subject to the authorities. When Pilate stood before him and said, don't you know I have the right, the authority to cast you or, or to have you killed? Jesus says, you have no right that's not given to you by God. And yet he still submitted to Pilate. He was respectful. He was kind. He was kind and respectful to the Pharisees. He chased him out of the temple with a whip once. That's 
So I mean, he's still Jesus, so that was the perfect right response for him to do in that moment. We know that. But he was always respectful, always kind, always honorable to those who were his rulers and his authorities, even though he himself was God. And because he did that, when we fail, when we sin, we still have hope. We can have hope that God will forgive us and love us and accept us into heaven, not because we have been the perfect subjects to our governing authorities, but because Jesus has on our behalf and that he died for the many, many times we have failed to submit to our government. In fact, he died on either side with rebels. The man to whom he said, you will be with me in paradise, was a probably a terrorist, a rebel against the Roman government. And because of Jesus' work on the cross, that rebel was able to enter heaven. So if you have failed in these areas, as I have many times, there is hope and grace in the gospel of Jesus. He died for it. He was resurrected to absolve you and to give you new life. You may have life more abundantly as a faithful subject of your government. Um, let's see. Joe says, meeting right now would be a bad witness to the world. It would not be loving your neighbor as yourself or looking out for the interests of others to spread sickness. Absolutely. And loving our neighbor fulfills the law. That's what Paul says in verse 8. Sarah says, good point. Jesus was subject to the authority that he created that he knew would kill him. Yeah. I mean, as much as we struggle with our government, we tend to assume the best or assume the worst. Jesus knew the worst. <laughs> and he knew it was true. He knew that those trials he was in would be false and made up. He knew that justice would be miscarried. He knew all those things. And still he submitted and was right. So. Good points, guys. I'm glad that glad that you're grasping this. And I want to be clear. It's not that I have some great handle on this. I struggle with it. Um, I'm, I'm a sinner in this area as well. But I rejoice that I have a Savior who loves me despite my failings. Um, I'll give just a few more minutes, uh, a few more seconds maybe for questions in case somebody has a question. And then we'll go ahead and wrap up our stream tonight. I'm really enjoying doing this. Someone keeps hitting the angry face. I'm not sure if that's an accident or if you're really mad at something I've said. If you're mad at me, you know, let me know. Maybe don't post as a public comment unless you want to. Um, but yeah, whoever's hitting the angry face, I'd love to talk with you about it. Uh, <laughs> I want to make sure that I haven't offended anyone. If I have offended you or if there's something you disagree with, let me know. I would love to walk through this with you and talk through it with you. Uh, Cameron asked, what program did you use uh, for that Greek word thing? Um, this is Logos. It's a Bible program. Uh, there's a couple really expensive versions. There's also a couple of less expensive versions. So I'm not sure what level you need to use this, but uh, I, I really love it. You can just click on a verse. It tells you all the Greek, and then you can do like a Bible word study and see where it's used. Um, if you're a nerd like me, it's awesome. Uh, there's free versions. Esword does similar things, and there's a couple other Bible study apps, so I'd encourage you to look into those. I don't know all of them because uh, I was I was given this by my church when I started seminary, which I'm very thankful for. So uh, there's uh, there's other versions. I, I didn't look into them. That's, that's the program I'm using there is, is Logos Bible Software. <clears throat> Billy's on here. Billy, I appreciate you. He's a pastor in, in Northern Illinois. I'm thankful for his friendship. He was in seminary with me. Glad to see you on here, man. Um, let's see. I'll look back through, see if there's any questions I missed. Don't think so. All right. Well, I, uh, I love you guys. I'm thankful for you. I'm glad you guys tuned in. Uh, I'm looking forward to church, but I'm, I'm starting to get used to just sitting in this room talking to myself in a way. So uh, I've, I've enjoyed our time together. I'll post this. If, if you guys have any questions, like I said, be sure to let me know. Whoever angry face is, I'd love to talk with you. Um, I'm really encouraged by our time together. I'm encouraged with our hope that, um, that we have in Christ. And I'm thankful that our salvation is not dependent on us meeting in church. I'm thankful we don't have to do works to be saved. We can depend on Christ. So let me pray for you. And then, um, and then we'll close our stream. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that though we are rebels, that we do stand up for our rights and we resist the government that you've put in place. You are so gracious to us. You are forgiving. You are loving. <coughs> and God, I pray that you would help us to give honor. You would give, you would help us give, uh, 
God, give honor and to pay our taxes, to pay what is owed, whatever that is. If our government asks us to do something that does not violate scripture, let us strive to do it. If, if uh, our government asks us to walk a mile, let us walk too. Let us be willing to serve, to give of ourselves, to give up what we want for the good of others, for a clear conscience, to avoid God's wrath, and for the Lord's sake, for the sake of our testimony around the world, I pray you would work through us in this way. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you even for this technology that allows us to share the good news of Jesus Christ, even when it comes to the restrictions of our government, that he is our hope in life and death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, anything? Let's see. Oh, okay. I see a comment here from Kurt. It's a little more obscure, but Matthew 17, the story of two drachma tax. Jesus said to pay a bogus tax so that we do not offend them. Yeah, he got the money from a fish's mouth. If, if any of y'all can do that, let me know. <laughs> I'd love to pay my taxes with fish money. But yeah, Jesus consistently pays pays his taxes. Jesus himself paid taxes. That's crazy. Thankfully, they didn't charge him taxes based on his, his, uh, his property, right? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That would have been a high tax rate. Let's see. Um... All right, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to end the stream. I always mess up ending it somehow. So I'll be here. We love you guys. Pray. Let me know if there's anything we can do for you.